know, we've been centering our, uh, our sermons around the, the book of Acts for three weeks and the idea of the book of Acts in the, in the 21st century uh, that we're living in. And the book of Acts is basically a bunch of stories of what God had done. And, uh, you know, we need to have those very stories. This, uh, this week I, I had, uh, well, actually for the last two weeks I've had house guests. Uh, many of you know that I have a ministry in France and Matthew, one of the young men who came over five years ago as an atheist, uh, came to Christ, and uh, he's, he was back visiting, and his girlfriend was in the United States studying uh, in uh, Atlanta, and so she finished her session there and then came over, and so he really wanted, she's not yet a Christian, and she, he really wanted her to have a dose of Kansas City Christianity because... Uh, it's really hard in France, I want to tell you, and, and this girl is delightful, but her, she comes from extreme wealth. Her, they, they own a winery that's been in for centuries, and they're in like, I don't know, 100 square miles. I don't know how much, it's amazing all the territory that she, their family owns. So she, she, she I would say, would, uh, has, has had a lot of things during her life, but uh, you know, where ministry really gets messy, the title of the sermon today is figuring out how do you, how do you, what's the right moment, you know? You, kind of, you have someone that isn't really that in tune, doesn't, isn't really, is kind of disinterested in Christianity, and what do you do? And so all week I was, list, I was praying and I was looking for an opportunity, really for two weeks, and it just wasn't really exactly right. There was always different people around, and, it was, and the discussions weren't such that it was going to lend itself that way, and or she was tired from uh, all of her travels and everything. And then the last night, which was two nights ago, uh, we had a dinner set up, and then everybody fell out of it except her and I and her boyfriend. So we went to the restaurant. And that's when we really, really, really got into it and really started sharing about Christ. And it started as I was, I was asking her about her background and how she'd said, well, Really, no one in my family went to church except my grandmother was a Catholic, and we, my family has never gone to church. It's never meant anything to us. Matthew, my boyfriend, is really involved in church now, and, and I, we haven't understood why he goes to church, you know, it's basically what she says. And uh, so then I started sharing my story of how I came to Christ and a few other stories of the power of God at work and... Uh, she, she was very interested, and she says, this is, this is fascinating to me what you're saying. And she, while she was in Atlanta, she was staying in a home of people who were Christians also, but they kind of just shared Bible verses with her all the time, and also said negative things about France all the time. <laughs> it just doesn't go together, you know. <laughs> I'm sorry. You can't say you have a dumpy cr- uh, country, become a Christian, you know. It just, it isn't going together, you know. And so, you know, I, well, how I look at it is they planted some seeds of Scripture in her life, and then she was ready. Yeah, so at the airport yesterday afternoon, and I took them to the airport, and her uh, boyfriend was in the bathroom. And so I said, well, what did you really think about that? She says, you should write a book of all your experiences. <laughs> and I said, <laughs> I said, no, I don't think so. But, uh, <laughs> but I do want you to think about Christ, and I know we'll see each other. They're probably going to be at UMKC next year. So it'll be back in the area. So uh, I'm praying for her. Her name's Cammie, if you want to pray for her. But it's, you know, sharing the gospel is sharing our story, sharing God's story, and bringing the two together. But it can be messy while you're doing it. We've been centering our attention around Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Uh, You'll receive power when the Holy Spirit's come upon you. You'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the remotest part of the world. Johnny Roberts kind of started off our series talking about the church of Jerusalem and how they gave their whole hearts to God, and God added their number day by day. Those were being saved. They started right there in Jerusalem and started reaching out from there. Then the next week, uh, Mike Wickman came and shared about Philip in the desert uh, road leading the Ethiopian eunuch uh, to the Lord, to faith, which eventually would be the beginnings of the church in Ethiopia, and how we as Christians, need to get out of our comfort zone and go beyond our immediate friends and out into the world. This week's scripture in Acts chapter 16, 6 through 15, deals with Paul and Silas and Luke as they take the gospel worldwide and head to Philippi. 
So let's stand together as we read our God's Word. And we're going to get it. It's going to change here to Acts 16. Here we go. Okay. Let's read together. Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Pergia and Galatia, and having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia, when they came to the border of Masia, they tried to get to Phanidia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. So they passed by Masia and went down to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man from Macedonia standing and begging, Come over to us in Macedonia. And Paul had seen a vision. We got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. From Troas, we set out to sea and sailed straight to Samaras, the next day to Neapolis. From there, we traveled to Philippi, a Roman colony and a leading city of the district of Macedonia. We stayed there several days. On the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the river where we expected to find a place of prayer. <coughs> we sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there. One of them was listening to a woman named Lydia, a dealer of purple cloth, Tara Tara, who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. When she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. Please be seated. You know, our church has, has been called to being all in, bringing all in to invite people to Christ here and far away, to bring in all sorts of people in races and colors and sizes in order that we, by the Spirit of God, could make changes to our own lifestyles, relationships, and ways to spend our time. Are you willing to make changes in your life to lead others to Christ? The first part of it really is pray to find and follow God's vision. As we see Paul, and this is, this is messy, <coughs> because we see the Apostle Paul in this passage heading toward Asia two times, and he's blocked both times. And then he's, I'm sure, praying and trying to figure out what is wrong. I thought we were supposed to go to Asia. And then there's a vision, and a, a man from Macedonia points for him to come over, beginning the ministry really in Europe. Scripture tells us the best way to find God's vision in our lives and ministry is to pray without ceasing. It's always looking for God's opportunity. This can happen anywhere, anytime, when you least expect it, and it can be scary. This past week, I was in my office. A man walks in. He says, I've just gotten out of prison three years ago. I lost a job, I, and, and I, during all this whole thing, I'm starting to pray. Okay, God, what am I supposed to do with this? And uh, he says, I have a wife. Uh, my three-year-old uh, son, and uh, we need some money. I'm willing to work, do anything, just so that I could pay for another night in the hotel until I can find a job or until I get accepted into the City Union Mission uh, house out here. And uh, so I, I thought, well, we can put him to work in the garden, and I found some money to, to pay him. And then I was taking him back home uh, to the uh, hotel. And I said, well, how... You know exactly how did you get into prison? And he said, uh, for murder. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm driving along and I'm thinking, hmm, I've got, I gave him that money and I'm, I've got some extra money in my pocket and, uh, hmm. And uh, just then the next breath he says, I don't usually tell people that because it scares people. <laughs> <laughs> and he explains the situation to me. But, uh, but then what he said is, uh, I had been in prison uh, 22 years of a 25-year sentence, and I was released because I had be, become what they called a blue shirt. I would go, and, and anybody that was new to prison, I would introduce them to the prison, and he said, I became a Christian 14 years ago, and my life changed, and so 
I dedicated all my time to uh, sharing Christ with people in the prison. And uh, Christ is the center of my life. And I thought, wow, I'm glad I, I took the chance. <laughs> but I thought it was a chance, too. You know, and you get in situations like that, you don't know exactly what might happen. But that's the way it is with Jesus Christ. So I, I'm praying for all of us that we will pray for a vision of what God's plan is for us throughout our lives as we're unfolding the gospel and using uh, our lives to be manifestations of Jesus Christ. Are you praying for God's direction? I hope you are. Paul had that vision. He saw the Macedonian man standing and begging him to come over. We have a similar vision that's been laid out to us as a church to invite our neighbors to Christ, for, Christ, uh, for us to help with other churches to adopt 3,000 orphans in Kansas City, to support the Indian League in their efforts to plant 580 churches in the, pro in the province of Orissa, India. Uh, for $300 a year for five years, we can, each of us can take a town and pray for them as well. You know, something that, that we've seen happen already is that we have 253 uh, churches paid for so far. And 172 being prayed for. So we need, actually need more people praying than giving money, although we want to finish that out. And we also have three other churches that have joined in with us in the project. So it's going along very well. But when you're, you know, thinking about, well, how can I really begin to share my faith with others? I think the first step is taking time to investigate where to start. It's praying and looking around. It's what Paul actually probably did. He looked at his city, he began to talk to people, he asked questions, and he discerned that the best place for him to start was at the place of prayer by the river. He's looking there for God's person at the river bank. And he found her. It was Lydia, a wealthy businesswoman. She was a worshiper of God, open to God. As he began to speak to the group that was assembled there, he could tell that God was tugging at her heart. And, and and this is, this is the way it is with us, too. If we're out sharing Christ with other people, we get in discussions. Some people are very open, some aren't. Be looking at their body language, be looking and seeing what God is doing in their hearts and minds. I know for me, uh, as uh, my kids were younger, I was in all their activities in various ways. And I always was looking to see where the opportunities were in those spheres of influence. And, and it was the same with my wife's company. She, worked, she started at Marion Laboratories and, and the opportunities there. And, and it was amazing, even in something like that, <clears throat> a business, <clears throat> how they would actually call, call upon me to do prayers at regional meetings, which I thought I'd never seen anything like that in corporate America. But since I was a pastor and I was there and Mr. K knew that I was a pastor and it was, it was very interesting just to see how God can use you if you're open in whatever situation you are. But I, I, would, I always marveled because in every single group <clears throat> that my kids were in, <clears throat> in every single one, there were people that were open to God. And I, we'd be at our activities and we're sitting at the stands watching the baseball games. <clears throat> and uh, before you knew it, we were talking about God or in the scouting thing. Before we knew it, we were on a camp out and we were talking about God around a campfire. So what I'm saying to all of us today is these opportunities are here, they're around us. Uh, look for them and take advantage of them. People around us, they want to respond. Remember the testimonies a few weeks ago of the high school students as they came back from Haiti. As they came back, they were telling their friends about an experience of going to a foreign country. But then they went next to sharing about Jesus Christ and a relationship with him. Thank you, Jim. Appreciate that. And they invited them to Christ and come to church. I have been thoroughly amazed at since in April on our 60th anniversary celebration when we, are, we had this idea of bringing all in, how God is actually bringing people all in. And this is what I'm, what I'm saying. I'm walking around. I'm up in a meeting up on the second floor on Tuesday. And I'm looking out the window at, at the door. And there's a, a, a lady seemed to be lost or something, and so I said hello to her, and it's obvious that she was from China. She had a Chinese accent, and I went out and talked to her and said, what are, you, what are you doing here? Can I help you? And she says, I've just come to pray. 
And uh, we, we talked, and one week ago, she had been baptized in China, in a church in China, had just become a Christian. And now she was seeking out a church. Her husband was on, uh, he's in business, and he was here on business, and they're taking their daughter to some East Coast schools after this to, to look at where she'll go to college. And uh, she was here this morning at 8 o'clock in, in worship. And uh, she says, I will be back. I will be back. But I said, you're an answer to our prayer here at Colonial because we are praying that God will bring in all types of people here. And she was very excited about that, and she really believed that. She really believed. She said, because I thought it was an office building as I looked at it. And I came closer, and I came, I came in. I was afraid to come in, but I came in, and I realized that it was a church. And she just came right down to here and knelt and had prayer with God. So she was coming back a second time and exploring the building in the process. So people is bringing God, God is bringing people to us. One of the families of our church, for example, they were at a business meeting and they ran, man, ran into a man named Roy Mingo. And in this service, you've probably seen Roy down here. This today, he was at the 8 o'clock service. But uh, the very first week he was here, he felt like, boy, this is a great church. The next week he said, this is my church. I got to come. And within two more weeks after that, he joined the church. And uh, he saw God at work here, and he felt the love of the people. And uh, since that time, he's been leading us in amens and hallelujahs and, and igniting our faith. He did early in the 8 o'clock service today. He was, just as soon as I mentioned about the Chinese gal that was here, Wendy, he, he was giving a real hallelujah and amen on that one. I said, you're next, Roy. <laughs> and, uh, and he was right in my notes. He was just right on task. Since we started uh, talking about adopting the orphans of Kansas City, God is bringing people to us. Jason Bone, for example, an adoption professional who's using his uh, numerous uh, gifts to build and to put together a team. There's 15 people right now that are on this team, and they're getting direction from God as to how to start this new ministry. On June 29th, the, the fellowship hall back there was filled to hear Pastor Aaron Blake from Texas tell about his church that has an adoption culture, adopting uh, as many kids almost as, as there are people in that church now. I know in, in our congregation there's, there was something pretty close to maybe 50 families that had come to that, and there's maybe as many as 100 families in our church that have adopted or been in a, uh, foster care in some way. But our first move now is to find ways to better support the families in our church that have already adopted. So Jason's building a network of support, and some of you who might want to add in, please do, uh, to adopt, including prayer, respite care, overnight help, daytime babysitting, tuition help, counseling, meals, and rides. He's also working and, and, and thinking about how we might have someday a, a church-owned youth center slash home for teens most at risk that are out on the streets right now, a lot of homeless teens, many foster kids that that are, that are forced to leave the system at 18 and are right on the streets right now. So be praying and thinking about these ideas. For people who want more information, contact Jason or come to our potluck luncheon at the church, uh, at, Warnell, at the Warnell Church on November 3rd, right after the last service, and share the vision. If you're already involved in, in foster care or adoption, we have an information, if you want to get involved in foster care or adoption, we have an informational meeting on August 29th at 6 p.m. right here at Quivira and classes to train you if you're interested on Thursday, September 5th. You know, one of the, the coolest things of, of reading the book of Acts is when the power of God really falls. And it's, in our time, it is the, it's the most exciting thing, too, when you see the power of God fall in amazing ways to do different things. And there's nothing more exciting than seeing the power of God fall through our lives. Lydia, Lydia had been prepared by God and excitingly opened her heart and her resources to God as she received Jesus Christ. Next, her whole household joins and is baptized. And suddenly, a house church is formed right there in her mansion and becomes Paul's headquarters in that day. This is the exact method that the Indian League uses in planting the 70,000 churches that they have in the last 23rd, 20 years. Their barefoot pastors travel by foot or on motorcycle to small villages to parts of large cities. They proclaim the gospel, baptize, disciple, and equip 
to reach others. You know, really, even in our own church, uh, Corey in, from the youth ministry has started a house church of, of young adults, and that, that is growing and, and wants to be spread throughout the city. The Gospel League also has educational classes, community development, medical care, food relief, and children's homes. So we are going to do our church planning in the region of Arissa. It's about 40 million people in that region, region, in five specific areas of that region. And here again, for $300 a year for five years, we could plant, each of, of us could plant a church. Uh, uh, or uh, we, we right now have so many people that have sponsored these churches that we do need more people to pray. Next Sunday, August 11th, that Sunday at 6, there's going to be a special celebration and meeting and meeting for the India Project to connect with our other church partners. So that would be a great time to come. There will also be our first mission trip to India February 4th through February 13th. So we're calling you to pray, go, and invest and uh, be excited about it. I'm, I'm amazed though, when things really start going for God, how Satan comes in to spoil them. Satan, the world, and the trials that upset the work of God. You know, my next major point is that Satan wants to mess up kingdom work once it gets going. I'm sure the church was rejoicing as it was spreading. They were probably going down to the place of prayer <clears throat> to have more prayer for the church. And then in Acts 16, 16 through 21, they're accosted by a slave girl with the spirit of divination. And her masters got a lot off that fortune-telling ability that she had. But she kept crying out that these are the men that were bond servants of the Most High God who were proclaiming the way of salvation. She continued for many days. Then Paul finally cast the demon out of her. Well, that wasn't such a good thing because her owners lost their income from her. And so that ticked them off, you know. Finances cause a lot of problems, don't they? Anyway, they complained to the city authorities about this they, and, and said, these men are throwing our city into confusion. We always need to remember there's a spiritual battle going on around us when we really want to do kingdom work. In Ephesians 6.10, finally be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against powers, against world forces of darkness, against spiritual forces of wickedness. In the heavenly places. Take up the full armor of God that you may be able to resist on the evil day, having done everything to stand firm. Pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be on alert and keep praying for all the saints. In uh, the history of my ministry uh, over the last 45 years at the church, uh, Whenever God moves, the devil counters. Early in our youth ministry in 1970, hundreds of people were coming to Christ, and all of a sudden, a motorcycle gang uh, appears at our meetings and starts knocking people around, hitting people over the head with Pepsi bottles, etc. We prayed them out of there, and most of them went, ended up to jail, and, and one of them ended up with Christ. Then, <clears throat> you know that I started work in the inner city at, at 32nd and Troost, Paseo right in there. And uh, <clears throat> when I was there, there were crack houses on either side of us, and Dr. Mack came over and threatened to blow up the house that I was in. <clears throat> so we prayed out of that situation. Whenever you go forward for God, you're gonna, there's going to be spiritual warfare. Maybe some of you have seen uh, the show on TV, uh, Long Island Medium. Uh, <clears throat> today, people in our culture think, oh, mediums are cool. They're a novelty. You know, the book of Leviticus says uh, they are condemned to death. They're an evil uh, abomination to the Lord. But uh, these are lighthearted in our culture in time today. In, as we go and, and minister in India, the Hindus worship demons and call them their gods. We need to be sure to pray for our church in India as they're getting started. They're in the, in the throes of such demonic activity. What else we see is not only Satan's uh, power to come against our ministries, but those who minister are going to suffer hardship. <clears throat> those who minister will suffer hardship. As we continue to read on in Acts 16, 22 through 23, the chief magistrate 
throws him in prison, beats him with rods, strikes him with many blows, and fastens them in stocks. Those who follow Christ will suffer. For us, it may be the rejection of friends. It may be ridicule. In the region of India, as they're ministering, it could be that you'll get your head chopped off, as some of the barefoot pastors have had happened to them already. So some of the ones, very ones that we are sponsoring, this could actually happen to them. <clears throat> you know, we are calling our church to make a small sacrifice right now, starting August 18th. We're unifying both the services at the Warnell location. They're 9, 15, and 11 are coming together for the purpose of, of building new enthusiasm and atmosphere in that large sanctuary, bringing everyone together to uh, work on, the, on reaching out together. Well, this part of what the strategy is is that Jim will preach every week, really, basically, at the 11 o'clock time at the Warnell location. And so what this means for us at... Uh, Quivira is that we're going to have to make a sacrifice uh, at, at, from our 11 o'clock service that becomes actually 1045 as Todd announced. Uh, Jim will not be there live preaching, but he will be there live in the first 15 minutes of the, of the service, kind of interacting with people and maybe singing a song or something as a part of worship on that day. You know, <clears throat> a lot of the people here at Quivira uh, don't remember when we started 15 years ago. Uh, but we started when 200 people from the Warnell group started going to St. Thomas Aquinas. <clears throat> uh, all the money and everything came from the Warnell location. Sacrifices were made at that time by Warnell for us. And I think, and I am praying for us at this time that we will make our sacrifice, which is pretty small, just watching Jim, which we usually, you know, have you ever noticed as many complaints at first as we had uh, not having a preacher up front, you usually look at the screens, don't you? I mean, all of us do, even if we're, I do. Look in the front row, I look at the screen. Jim is bigger on the screen than he is in real life. <laughs> that, is, that is for sure. <clears throat> but, you know, I'm just praying that it will be, that people won't, won't suddenly move to this service from the 11 o'clock, that we can keep uh, the balance that we have right now. Jim will be here live at 8, 5, uh, 9, 15, and 6 anyway. The rest of the story is so wild, it's fascinating to me. Paul and Silas, while in prison, are praying and singing hymns of praise to God. I don't know how many of you, after being beaten with rods, would be singing praise of him to God, but they were. The other pres prisoners were listening. They were being touched by the Spirit. Even in the worst conditions, the gospel always moves forward. They were rejoicing when they encountered various trials. They knew that God causes all things to work together for good in the lives of those that love God and are called according to his purpose. Suddenly, in the midst of their prayers, a mighty earthquake occurs, shakes the handcuffs off, opens the doors of the prison. The jail guard was ready to kill himself, thinking the prisoners had escaped. They'd stayed in jail. Seeing that they hadn't left, the jailer fell to his knees, repents, accepts salvation. He takes them home out of prison, bandages, bandages their wounds, and the whole, he was baptized then along with his whole, whole family. Bad situations turn into life change through our obedience. Later, Paul would write the Epistle of Joy, the book of Philippians. I think it was his favorite church, Philippians 1.3. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. Always offer in prayer with joy in every prayer for you all in view of the participation of the gospel from the first day until now. For I'm confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will continue to perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. It's only right for me to feel this way about you since I have you in my heart. You know, there's really nothing greater for any of us than the sense of, of feeling that you are a tool in God's hands and that, uh, that someone has come to Christ. I got to usually speak at our confirmation classes for our young people, and, and surely most, mostly all of our young people have become Christians at very young ages, there was a newer student that was in the group, and uh, she was, was there at the class. I didn't really know her, really even who she was. But I gave the invitation, and then I said, you know, with all eyes closed and heads bowed, is there anybody that just prayed that prayer today? And, and her hand went up like it was going to the moon. It was so dramatic. And ever since that time, I've been observing her in action. And she was in Bible school assisting, and she was giving testimony up here, and on mission trips and all this other stuff. God is at work. 
And someday I, I think someone like this will probably be on our youth staff. But there's no greater joy than seeing people come to know Jesus Christ. As I conclude today, I just pray for you that you'll be a part of this all-in vision fully. That God will give you the Lydia's people in your workplace, your neighborhoods, your schools, your recreational activities that you'll engage and invite them to Jesus Christ and his church. And I would just challenge you right now today to stretch yourself to show someone that you never met the good news of the gospel. I encourage you to help out with an orphan and help them find a place in God's family. I pray that you would work for the barefoot missionaries as they go share the good news. That you would be a witness to your Jerusalem, to your Samaria, and the remotest parts of the world. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, it's easy to talk about these things. It's easy to go, boy, that's cool. It's easy to see uh, people who have gone out, even in our time by faith, and seen a difference made. But you're really calling all of us to do these sorts of things. That's our vision as a church. And I pray that you'd help us to step out of our comfort zones and take a stand for Jesus Christ. Wherever we are, in whatever situation we are, that uh, we would be your witnesses, God. We thank you for our church. We pray that we would be moving forward in the power of your spirit uh, worldwide and locally. In Jesus Christ's name, amen.